My record, my registered SCA name is Alessandra de Berberf. I have been a, a member in, let's see, I think it's up to five kingdoms now. And I've been in the SCA more than 50 years. When I joined, I was young, healthy, uh, able to stay up for two days straight because I have bipolar type 2. Um, except for the bipolar type 2, none of the above still apply. So the main thing you folks need to know is that I also have Sokoreva syndrome. It's on the autism spectrum. I don't read social cues. I don't read tones of voice at all. So I might accidentally, please understand it's accidentally, say or do something you think is rude. And if I do, please, you know, put in the chat, hey, you phrased that wrong or whatever, because if you don't, I'm going to do it to another 50 people. And that would be bad. So we're going to start with the uh, the sites that you can see ahead of time, because those are the ones that you have the most influence over. Some things in my mind are dead deal breakers for a site. You just do not rent them, because I've seen how incredibly many times it goes bad, often very, very bad. The first of those is a bathroom that is not accessible except by stairs. Don't go there. I mean, even with modern incontinence products, meaning that people don't have to turn a T-shirt into a diaper anymore, don't go there. They'll still need a place to change out of the wet one into a dry one, and they can't get to the toilet. The other one is places where it is impossible to get away from the noisiest part of the event. Because we, by the nature of our game, have an unusually high percentage of people on the autism spectrum. And many of them cannot tolerate a continuous noisy environment for an entire day. That includes me nowadays. So if there is no way to even put up a tent on the lawn and line it with old blankets to make a quiet space, that's a bad sight. And that's a bad sight that can't be fixed. I just, if I'm on the selection team, I say no for any site that does that is like that because you are going to have somebody have a massive meltdown due to overstress from the amount of painful. And yes, it is literally painful stimulation. stimulation. Uh, people think it's like, oh, well, yeah, a loud party, it bothers me too. No, it doesn't bother us. It hurts us. We would have just as much fun if you were sticking a needle in our arms every 10 seconds. So if you don't have either of those problems to deal with, and therefore it is not an absolutely intolerable site, there are still things that are going to have to be watched for and dealt with, usually by the site owner, sad to say, before you can rent the site. Handicapped accessible back bathrooms of some kind, there should be at least one. And by handicapped accessible, I mean the door is wide enough that someone in a manual wheelchair can wheel themselves in. Because with rare exceptions, people in wheelchairs are not one-year-olds, and they do not want to have to lie down on the floor in the changing room while someone changes them because there is no accessible bathroom. Some places have what they think are accessible bathrooms, and they very seriously are not, simply because the door is not wide enough for a wheelchair. So you have to check that. The ADA has a site um, where you can check things like minimum width for an accessible bathroom door, uh, maximum steepness of a ramp, all that kind of stuff. Visit it. Read it. Take it to heart. It's a good thing, and it's free, which is always nice. 
another common mistake people make is they make homemade ramps. And yeah, if you've got your 19 year old son charging up that ramp with a wagon full of uh, logs for the fireplace, it works great. But when you've got my someone my age on an elbow type walker, it's potentially fatal because elbow walkers have a maximum state safe slope that you cannot exceed and still have the person stay upright. So you need to be able to check the slope and see if it's a one of those loving hands at home ramps that was never meant to actually handle a real handicapped person. The There are things that don't seem like they have anything to do with accessibility, suitability for SEA use to a person who is not neurodivergent and is not physically or mentally disabled. A big one of that is how well can you cover distracting decor? If the hall has a painting of an aquarium on one wall with all these weird tropical fish from someplace no one's ever heard of, including the fish, you're probably going to want to put a, drop, a painted drop cloth over that wall because people nowadays are really good at expressing motion in flat paint. And that is going to give people with some forms of astigmatism the headache of the century. And it's going to cause many neurodivergent children to spend the entire day trying to break away from their parents and touch every fish on the entire wall all the way up to the nine foot ceiling. If there are a lot of photographs, especially those stiff, I'm staring at you, photographs that you see in Masonic halls and corridors in schools of all the past principles of A.D. High, whatever, they, those are very disturbing for some types of autistic people, including me, because they're watching you. They're looking at you. They're faces that you are not supposed to pay any attention to, but you can't read faces, so you're paying attention to every face in your environment. And that includes, of course, the faces in the pictures. Again, I mean, a pillow slip with a hole for the little hook that you hang it from and put get one that's a pattern or paint a pattern on it. Anything to just remove the extra faces clutter from the environment makes a world of difference because it prevents sensory burnout since they don't have to try and pay attention to things that have nothing to do with the event. There are also issues of some kinds of textures. The worst I have ever seen was a artistic corkboard ceiling where some of the corkboard pieces, they were all three inch square, had been raised and lowered to provide sound deadening, except that it had been do done wrong and it didn't sound deaden, but it did create a lot of pocket shadows where people passing by would suddenly see out of the corner of their eye the shape of a mouse or a bat or a piece of fruit or God alone knows what up there. Fortunately, that barony had a guy with a fair amount of money in a fabric business, and he got them some reject fabric to make a Persian tent out of that room. But barring something like that, you may have to use that room only for storage or chaining, changing or the royalty room if they can take that ceiling and not get weirded out by it. Because people on autism spectrums can become king and queen, too. It really happens. I like, everybody likes the sites that have a lot of wood and have a medieval feel to them, even if the actual architecture is so 1950s, there's no possibility of mistaking it. If it's completely all made out of wood, it feels better. But some woods, especially the real hard woods, like pin oak and some kinds of mahogany, reflect sounds insanely well. You can stand on one side of one hall that a group in New Hampshire used to rent a lot and hear everything that was being said in the opposite corner as clearly as if they were standing next to your ear. 
eventually they started putting things near the edges that like folding screens and stuff that caused that sound reflection to dampen. Sound reflection can be bad not only for people with neurodivergence issues, but for deaf people, it's hideous. And for many small children, it's terrifying because small children need to know where the input in their environment comes from. And if somebody's talking about beating somebody up and how much fun it was, and the kid can't tell that he's on the far side of the room, 100 feet away from them, his event just got ruined. And so did mine, because I have to turn off my hearing aids. So check for that. Floors, old floors, old warped floors. If you can't get the site to refinish them, and you can't find a cheap piece of leftover carpet to put over squishy stuff over the warped part of the floor, you're going to have to seriously consider barring it off, putting in a feeding station for the fighters or a watering station or the kids' play area and check with the parents if they have problems with rough floors something to prevent it being used by most of the people at the event because people at an event are distracted they're enthused kind of nerved up because they're excited about where they are and what they're doing they are not paying adequate attention to their footing and they go across this place where the floor, ch floor changes by three inches in two paces they may go down and if you're unlucky enough, they may go down like I do when somebody has to escort the ambulance to the VA. I'm a disabled veteran. I have to go to a VA hospital or pay a fortune. Anyway, outside, there are just as many issues, but they're different issues. The issues outside are less about neurodivergence and deafness and little kids because little kids outside are usually with a caretaker who knows what's going on with their heads. But some features of especially natural landscape like parks and Boy Scout camps are very hard on anyone who has mobility problems. I am going to ask my sister in a minute to take this um, camera because our computer's dead and we're doing this on a phone and show you what the different kinds of walkers look like, especially their wheels. I am lucky enough, since I am a disabled veteran, to have a standing walker, also sometimes called elbow walkers because you rest your elbows on them, which has huge wheels. The reason I say lucky enough is because gravel paths or worse yet, sanded paths are a terror for anyone using a wheeled conveyance of any time kind. Mm -hmm. Even handicapped assist scooter bikes are a problem, although not as much of a problem because their wheels are bigger and wider. And the bigger and wider the wheel, the safer it is on gravel and sand. But there's a lot of people who are getting their walkers from a cheap Goodwill. insurance company or Goodwill or Walmart, and they're not getting the big wide-wheeled walkers that are designed for gravel and sand. They're getting scoot walkers, where you're supposed to pick it up, put it forward of you, and then take a step. And you cannot scoot a scoot walker on most gravel and sand paths. It will sink enough that they will not be able to pull it up and reset it stably for the next step. Grassland, if it is going to be walked over by most of the event, has to be checked very carefully for animal dens. You may have to put a sack of playground sand down the gopher hole and let him deal with it after you leave. Uh, if you have a lot of molar vole holes, you may have to ask the site to roller over that portion of the lawn that is going to be walked on all day because mole and gopher holes break ankles. And what's worse, they dislocate them. When I damaged my ankle in basic training, the doctor said it was such a pity I didn't break it because that they could have fixed. 
we don't want that. <laughs> that is not a good thing. It is not happy making. Water, outdoor water features of various kind have various hazards. For the love of God and all his little angels, if the pool is unlockable, if you can't lock something higher than five feet, because teenagers and young fighters, to keep people out of it, it has to be guarded. Streams and uh, ditches, even if they have bridges over them at intervals, are the bridges at a place where someone using a motility assist, uh, mobility assistance device can reach them? And are they attractive enough, either because it's hot and they're cool or because they have funny things growing in them, that little children are going to try and climb down the banks and play in them? Or for that matter, big children. Or for that matter, dukes. Doesn't matter. You have to be able to rope off the areas that are likely to be an attractive nuisance. Have the site rope them off if they will. But if not, figure out something on your own. It's worth the work. The worst kind of water feature, by the way, is what in uh, my part of the country we call a site, which is a seasonal stream. It's not there when you examine the site in uh August, but when you come back for the event in October, it's flowing two feet deep right across the path. Make sure you ask if there are seasonal streams on the property and where they are. It could really ruin your day if the court is on one side of a psych and the people who are supposed to come up and get their awards are on the other. And it won't be fun. And it might Ruined some very nice, very expensive garb. So check on that. Mud. Mud comes in different kinds. There's clayey mud, which tends to resist uh, being pushed. There's what we call slip mud, which dives right out from under you. And if you're wearing crutches and you've got slip mud to deal with, God help you, because nothing else can. And there's liquid mud, which is essentially essentially a thick pond. You need to know which kind it is, if there's any of that. And if it's liquid mud, again, it needs to be roped off or flagged, because someone like me is having a good day, and she's wear, walk, using her crutches instead of her walker, and bang it, down she goes. Or he, equal opportunity falls. I got, at one point, although it was many years ago and long before computers, made up a checklist of all these things so that I would not make an error and brush off something that I already knew was important, important but my brain is offline for a second. It really, really helps. And it really helps if you have sites you use regularly to have and make and put in your Seneschal's handbook a list of all their barriers. Uh, if you have an outdoor event where you're going to rent porta pot potties or biffies or loos or whatever you call it locally, and the only internal flush toilet is up a flight of stairs, one, you need to rent at least one accessible toilet. And not just for the people with the walkers and the wheelchairs. The tutors need it too. Because those hoop skirts in a standard church bathroom, no. But you have to put in the event announcement anything that might be a deal breaker for someone. There are people who, can't, for example, are going to be coughing their lungs up if... The uh, site is a smoking okay site, and you don't declare it no smoking. Make a, an area downwind of the main part of the event for smoking, if you're going to allow smoking at your event, so that all the people who are allergic to nicotine 
won't find themselves basically trying to eat epinephrine because it's the only thing that's going to save them. Last year at Pensick, someone was 60 feet away smoking, and I ended up hospitalized. So that's something to consider. Yes, I'm allergic to marijuana. Someone just posted a comment about that. And uh, I've had people tell me that you can't be allergic to marijuana because it soothes your lungs. And my response was, right. That's like telling my ex-husband he couldn't be allergic to nylon because it was an artificial fiber. He almost lost several toes. People can be allergic to literally anything. I agree. There are things about a typical outdoor site, especially parks, uh, uh, campgrounds, places where we will be camping overnight that are not usually noticed as potential hazards, but we need to notice them. One of those is, does the site clear its tent stakes? Especially if you're there in the spring and they didn't clear the tent, tent stakes either at the end of last fall's camping season or before they opened this year. You could have someone in those wonderful new shoes with the points on them catch a tent stake and face plant and break their neck. Another is if it's an event that is a site Not that is designed for camping, the fire pits. Are they actual pits or are they just level ground? Because if they're actual pits, they need to be marked. People will look at an unused fire pit and say, and walk right through it and not realize that there's eight inches of ashes in that thing. And you need to check for toxic flora. Toxic fauna are pretty obvious. If your place, your site has a place on the edge that has been a rattlesnake hibernation site for 100 years, you know you're going to rope it off. But toxic flora, most people ignore. If you roast marshmallows on a rhododendron twig, you can get so sick that you'll ask the doctor to euthanize you. And if you feed it to your two-year-old, you might have to buy a coffin. There are hundreds of toxic plants, not just the really obvious ones like poison sumac and poison oak and poison ivy, although, of course, you check for those. But things like some kinds of berries that are a fairly good imitation of blueberries will make you so sick even a dog wouldn't take it. And kids eat them. There are pretty plants that they might want to pick and bring to you and they get the sap all over their hands and then you give them a lollipop and it's sticky on their hands and they lick the lollipop and they're swallowing lily of the valley sap and there is a pediatrician in your future. If you are not already familiar with the toxic plants of your area, the library has excellent books and the internet has excellent sites. Take a picture of any plant that you don't recognize and do a search on Google um, visuals. Google, image search. Image search on Google to find out what kind of plant it is and what kind of hazards it may present. There are places where you're not going to find anything. Lots of them. Yay. Thank God. But there is, was a site that was used a lot in Virginia long ago, and it was full of oleanders. And even just the act of peeling the bark off a piece of oleander can really do a job on you. And this couple, fortunately, they were not Scadians, cut, again, marshmallow toasting twigs from the oleanders. And... I don't know how many of the family, but at least several people in the family died. And there was nothing anyone can do. I don't know of any antitoxin for oleander poison. Okay. That's the first half. 
I'm going to open it for questions. If anybody wants to ask a question, um, this is being recorded. So you can, if you put it in the chat, it will have your real name. And I tried to work one up and yes, recording is now in progress again. I tried to work up a handout or a set of notes for this class and our computer is deceased. So I couldn't do that on a phone. Just my fingers are not that willing to press little tiny buttons for thousands of times. Now we're going to go to sites that you did not see ahead of time and what you can do when you get there and discover that there's a problem. Now, part of that is being prepared ahead of time if you've got a site that you did not get to vet personally. Many, many years ago, there was an event in a small shire that I was in where we took the word of one of our enthusiastic young members that a certain church would be great for our event because it had a, a lovely hall and a huge kitchen. And she listed all the things like six burner stoves and three ovens. And we're going, woo And the night before, the uh, head cook walks in to put in the refrigerated goods in the refrigerator for the morning and she takes one step and she takes another step and when she goes to take a third step her shoe comes out of her foot it comes off of her foot because the floor was so unbelievably filthy that her shoe stuck to it we had people who'd come up from maryland in a, at a new england event at three in the morning scrubbing down that kitchen, trying to get it clean enough to be safe to cook in. So that kind of thing, that can happen. Another event, we did check it out ahead of time and it was a beautiful kitchen. And the day we got there, they discovered that they were, we discovered that they were upgrading and only two burners were actually usable. Massive menu changes at the very last possible second. But I'm going to start with the things that I've already mentioned. If the uh, handicapped accessible bathroom, bathroom isn't really handicapped accessible, negotiate ahead of time with your portage on people that if anything goes wrong with the plumbing, uh, you can get a last minute delivery. There will be a higher charge. That's why you always have to have a slush bun planned in for an event, because sometimes you've got no choice. We had an event where there was a psych at the foot of the only stairs into the building. But when we looked at the place in late July, all the grass was dead, but there was definitely no stream anywhere. And when we finally had the event, in a rainy November, there was not only ice coating every blade of grass that had managed to come back, but there was a lovely slushy stream across the bottom step to the event hall. Fortunately, the person in charge happened to know about something called ramp clamps. That's a nickname. I don't know what the formal name is uh, where you are, but it's a set of aluminum pieces that you can bolt onto the end of a board to create a ramp. And she sent somebody out to get ramp clamps and boards and some um, pebble surface uh, stair step covers. And they created a ramp for people to get up and into the event hall with. And it saved everything because I'm not stepping across two feet deep water in order to climb up two steps at a time while wearing hoop skirts. And a lot of other people felt the same way. If you have newly graveled or worse yet, newly sanded paths and they're nice and squishy and they give great underfoot so they don't hurt your toes, they're going to hurt the people in the wheelchairs. And again, you may need to lay down planks if it's any place that has to be accessible. And again, if you lay down planks, get the pebbled surface 
um, stair covers or some equivalent thereof so that there's grip. Threads. Threads. Anything that will provide a uh, grip surface for the wheels to engage on. Threads work great. If there is a section with poisonous plants, this is one place with that bright yellow day glow rope that doesn't work for tents and is absolutely horrible for most other purposes is perfect because it's instantly visible. If you have some clever people in your barony or people who have, as I once did, three bins of fabric that the second they open that they go, oh my God, what was wrong with me that I bought this stuff? You can make it into little flags for all the don't go here ropes and you can put things like skulls or medieval death's head or pictures of a coffin or whatever. But barring them off, even if you're doing it with yellow neon day glow rope, is a lot better than having some kid have to be hospitalized for four weeks because he brought a great big handful of poison oak over to the fire for daddy to drop in and then breathe the smoke. Inside, um, no, sorry. On roads that have bad potholes, again, if you can have some emergency supplies ready, supplies ready in advance for possible disaster, you can buy a couple of bags of uh, Riverstone, which is tumbled, washed round rocks, and they pack down better than the typical chipped rocks, which constantly move because they have no smooth surface to balance on. And you can fill in the bad potholes so that you don't break several people's axles and a couple of handicapped people's legs. If you do have to use it, you explain to the site why you had to use it and explain politely, respectfully, that you would like the money that cost you back. But if you don't have to use it, you just return it. Nobody at Lowe's, or probably nobody at Home Depot either. Sorry, that was my cat being difficult because she's a cat. Um, Nobody at Lowe's or probably Home Depot either is going to shoot you for returning something. So you can prepare ahead, and then if you didn't need it, you can return it, get the barony its money back or the Shire or the Canton or whatever it is you have. And yay. Yeah, uh, poison, poison sumac, man, that stuff and poison oak are actually worse than poison ivy because they contain higher concentrations and very slightly chemically distinct formulations of urishiol, the poison that makes poison ivy and so on so dangerous to people. I have a brother who was a smoke jumper and he uh, had to make a parachute drop into a forest fire and he landed downwind of a patch of poison oak or poison sumac. I don't know if they ever figured out which. And was hospitalized for months. So that's worth checking on. If the site allows uh, picking up and burning drop wood, dead branches and stuff especially, know what's on the ground there. Um, if it doesn't, Make very sure any wood that is brought in was bought locally, as in within a five mile radius, if possible, a 10 mile maximum radius of the site, because the ugliest little bugs hitchhike on firewood. We've had people try to bring firewood in from a place that already had emerald ash borers to a place 300 miles away that so very did not. I still don't know why they thought adding an extra 500 pounds in their trunk was a good idea, but it was a bad idea. And thank God there were, what do you call it? Uh, state police posted on the roads into this national forest saying, do you carry any firewood? Where did you get it? And they had to have it all 
pay to have it all wrapped up in bug proof stuff and take it all back home with them. Playground equipment. Many, many, many lovely event sites have playground ex equipment. Many lovely event sites have playground equipment that was last safety checked when Nixon was in office. No matter how much it breaks their little hearts, if half the chains are 50% rust, wrap all the swings around the top of the bar and if you have one big enough, throw a tarp over it and make it into a changing room. But don't let the kids play on it. Same with slides, same with merry-go-rounds, same with sand pits. There's some frequently some nasty stuff in sand pits, including uh, raccoons search for the stuff the last batch of kids dropped and raccoons poop wherever they happen to be standing. And there are parasites in their waste that can cause, among other things, blindness and insanity. And you can have a lot of little kids playing in that sandbox if you don't wake it ahead of time and check to make sure that it's detritus free. Not to mention toxoplasmosis. Yeah, not to mention toxoplasmosis, just for an extra little frosting of bad. Um, Suki, as the yeah. walkers ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have my sister uh, take, go out and give you a visual of the kind of walkers that we happen to have here and what the wheels look like, especially because I'm going to talk about what difference the types of walker and the wheels make in how careful you have to be about the paths and roads. So, This is my sister, Suki. She's playing mobility aid at the moment. Hello. I'm turning the camera around, I hope. Yes, okay. And I just took myself out of the classroom. No. Sorry about this. Okay, you just... There we go. All right. Let's try this again. I apologize if I'm making anybody seasick. Okay. This is Honor's current walker. It is what's called an elbow walker or a standing walker. And as you can see, there are rests for her elbows and it's got fairly large wheels. This is what most people think of as a walker. Folding seat, reservoir underneath it, folds up vertically. Notice the difference in the size of the wheels, much smaller. And this is your basic absolute cheapo, got it at Goodwill because somebody died and their family got rid of it. Walker. No place to put anything. Folds, but not very tightly. Is very rigid and hard to handle. And all three of these walkers have brakes. So knowing how to operate the brakes on someone else's walker is a good thing. The standing walker, you see this handle in the middle of the seat where my hand is? folds horizontally so that it makes a much smaller footprint when it's folded up. You have to actually lock the seat down in order to make sure that it's rigid enough for someone to move. So if you have to fold up a walker for somebody and you need to put it back before they can use it again, make sure that you lock the seat down if it's a standing walker. Okay, thank you, honey. Now, well, you saw with these walkers that the wheels come in a huge variety of different sizes, and that is a huge problem because the cheap walkers, which are the m ones you are most likely to find on the low-income elderly, have tiny wheels that get trapped in everything. You, It literally makes a mountain out of a molehill. 
because a molehill is enough of a variation in the surface of the ground that the tiny wheel will sink in and suddenly they're flipping right over their own handy handlebars and down. My regular walker, the one that is not a standing walker, has significantly bigger wheels because it's a very high-end walker. I have still tripped and gone down on things like a three-inch wide crack in the pavement. They are not ideal, but they're about the best you're going to get unless you can talk somebody into getting you a uh, mountaineering or equivalent walker, the ones that have wheels that are four inches wide. All terrain. All terrain walker. And many of those are so insanely heavy that no one over about 35 is going to find it easy to use. The standing walker, although it is much better for walking at something a decent, resembling a decent rate of speed, and it has good big wheels that will just ignore a three inch crack in the pavement, has one disadvantage, which is that your um, lean point is much higher up. It's at elbow height because it's an elbow walker. That means that if the ramp is not ADA compliant slant, especially if it's a ramp that people will be going down, they are going to go down and not in a good way because they will tip forward just from the place where their weight is leaning on the walker's frame. And you don't want that. It's for one thing, it's no fun. And for another thing, it's embarrassing to have to deal with. So homemade ramps, of course, can be very good ramps if you bothered to read the ADA requirements and include them in your planning, at least. You can negotiate with your site about some of these hazards and get them remediated sometimes you may not even need to pay them extra for that you can just say hey if we do a handicap compliance survey of your site and give you the results we can save you a fortune paying some expensive professional and you'll know what you need to remediate and it could save you from a lawsuit would you like us to do that and all the ones that aren't exceptionally stupid will go, oh, yeah, thank you. And then they will remediate these problems, at least most of them themselves, because they don't want a lawsuit. But if you have to do it, check with the site owners and see if you can get money off next year for that site because you had to repair problems this year and the place is now safer and less likely to cause a lawsuit. Often you can, not always because there are people that are real jerks in this world, but often you can. Um, we had one site where we built a bridge across a hideous huge ditch on the edge of the archery field. And the people not only told us we got in next year for free, but they paid for all the materials and equipment necessary to build that bridge. And since the archery was simply not going to occur without that bridge, it was a last minute change that we had to, you'll pardon the phrase, throw together with our eyes closed. But it worked. And the people that owned the site were very happy with us that it worked. So, you know, that can happen. There are some things that are situational hazards. They are not endemic to the site, but the site can make them worse or better. If you're having a four-day camping event and you bring in an ice truck, that's real nice. Everybody can get ice without going on site, and they're going to be very happy about that. The gentleman with autism who is a laurel with legendary fame in the musical arts who is supposed to run the Bardic Circle, which you placed next to the ice truck, is not going to be very happy with you. And neither are about nine-tenths of the singers or musicians or dancers or drummers. Move one of them. You, If you have a 
road in and a road out, and they're not the same road, and somebody decides that one of them is not safe for his beloved car and decides to go the wrong way down the wrong one, things could get very awkward very fast. So make sure you have good signage. One thing that I want people to do that many people look me in the eye and say, that's ridiculous and I won't. People in walkers, on crutches, in wheelchairs, in mobility scooters, in all-terrain aids, often have very poor bladder control and bowel control, one or both. The accessible stall, the accessible biffy, porta potty, whatever, has to be theirs first. It needs a sign that says, please give way for handicapped people who can only use this stall or some other, phrase it as politely as you can, but make sure the sign is there because it makes a difference between somebody having a wonderful event that they enjoy every second of and someone being told to wait in line for five people in front of her with a diaper full of, because that sign wasn't there. So I realize that's, kind of disgusting to think about, but it's a real issue. And I've had to deal with it. I've known people who had to deal with it. And I've had people be incredibly rude to me about it. You got to wait in line with everybody else. You're not special. No, I'm not special, but I am handicapped. And it does matter. One other thing that I just suggested in the class on military people in the SCA, if you're running an event, make sure you know where the nearest VA is. A lot of us veterans have only VA care. We do not have insurance to go to any other hospital. And if you don't know where the nearest VA is and we have to go to another hospital, you may not see us again until we pay off the bill 20 years from now. That's kind of a nasty thing to do to a guest. Ooh, excuse me. Oh, and lighting. Lighting is tricksy because, of course, you don't want to put on all the fluorescence in the basketball court and have the place look like it's uh, trying to be a, a bad stage set for the heaven portion of the ballet. But you do have to make sure every uneven surface is lit. And don't trust that an uneven surface that lit, that's lit when you walk in at 9 a.m. will still be lit at 5 p.m. Because sunlight moves and windows are stuck where they're stuck. So they may not let the sunlight into the right place at a different time of day. Check and Figure out a way to provide lighting, even if you use glue-on tap domes from the nearest hardware store. Because unlit steps are an invitation to disaster, even for people who have really great walking abilities. Me? So Solar-powered stake lamps for walkways. Ah, yes. Solar-powered stake lamps or uh, lamps that hang on those little mini shepherd's hook things for walkways are wonderful. Yes, yeah, some toddlers don't cooperate with candles or glass at feast. Absolutely. Some adults don't. I have a problem called peripheral neuropathy. I used to be a blacksmith. Would you trust that hand to 2,300 degrees? And I can't control it. So, hey, folks, I couldn't. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. That's okay. Oh, and, and I um, do want to make sure to let you know that we are at just about the five minute warning. So, um, if you have a question or a comment, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now since we're at the 25 or at the five minute point. Thank you, everybody, and you may continue on as you wish.